All right, I think we got some people still joining, but let's go ahead and get started. We have a jam-packed hour, and I want to make sure that there is enough time for everything here. So welcome to our research webinar series. So this is around The Price is Right, an introduction and tools for pricing research. So Ray Pointer from the, the new MR will be speaking, and I'll be speaking as well around some Question Pro and some of the different features and functionalities that we have that make up our pricing analytics suite. So just a quick introduction here before we get started. So Ray Pointer, if you if you all don't know him, I would be shocked actually. He, Ray has spent the last 40 years at the intersection of research, innovation, and business, having been involved in the development of CAPI, online systems, online surveys, and social media research. Ray has authored and helped edit a number of different publications, including the Handbook of Online and Social Media Research, the Handbook of Mobile Market Research, and a, a countless others. Uh, Ray's three main projects at the moment are uh, Chief Research Officer for Potentiate, developing tools and materials related to finding and communicating stories from data, and consulting and writing about the impact of new technologies and approaches. And when he's not doing this, you can probably find him running out on a trail somewhere. I know he's an avid runner, and we've, Ray and I have talked a lot about that. Uh, anyway, um, I'm Dan Fleetwood. I'm president of Research and Insights platform here at Question Pro. And um, before we get started with the webinar today, just want to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll, we will be doing a live Q&A at the end of the session. So feel free to put those questions in the Q&A and we'll get those answered. We should have enough time to answer a lot of questions as they come up. So Feel free to do that. Uh, we'll be answering those questions at the end. A recording of the webinar will be sent out um, afterwards. So feel free um, to, to look out for that in your inbox. And yeah, with that, kick back, relax, take some notes. And this is gonna be a good informative session and I know it'll be thought provoking as well. So with that, I'm just gonna get set up here and pass this um, over to Ray real quick. So give me a second while we Get the screen sharing going here and hold on. Okay. And then let me just share this screen. Okay. Let me do this. All right. Okay. Here we go. Hi, Ray here. And here is the agenda for this introduction to pricing research. We're going to talk a little bit about the background. Then I'm going to cover a range of tests and then we're going to have a quick think about how do we decide which technique to use. The sad news is that pricing research is actually quite flawed. There's a fundamental problem and that is our ability, human ability, to accurately assess what we're going to do in the future is very poor and what we're going to do if the price changes is even more flawed. So what has happened is that the research world has developed a wide range of approaches. Each one of these approaches deals reasonably well with some situations, but nothing is perfect. Some situations don't have a solution at all. As I say, there is a range of techniques we use. At one end of the spectrum, we have things that just look at price, like Gabor Granger. At the other end of the spectrum, we have things that give us more diagnostics. So we're going to run through the range of why we would choose one and what those techniques involve, their strengths and their limitations. So we're going to start with something which is, on the one hand is very straightforward, but on the other gives you a lot of diagnostics. And that's the priced concept test. So we might be testing a new concept, a new product. We might be looking at some new marketing. Ideally, the tests are going to be monadic. Every participant in the research is only going to see one cell. They're only going to see one price. Sometimes people do it sequential monadic, where you, they see one price, and then they see another price, and they see another price. We normally only test a small range of prices, typically two or three prices with this. We could test more, but very quickly the sample sizes get larger. 
So here's how we might do that. We would come up with a concept. So here's a concept for a Wi-Fi, internet, radio, and media player. We've got a price on it and a description. The first question we ask is purchase likelihood. We ask that before we ask anything else because once they start talking about what they like and they dislike, it makes the purchase likelihood question less predictive. So when we're really interested in a maximizing the predictive ability of a price concept test, we ask the purchase likelihood first. Then we can con consider likes, dislikes, how they might use it in the real world in terms of substituting for other products. So here's a very simplified example. On this occasion, I've interviewed three groups of 80 people and I've got a concept that I'm testing at $20 and $25 and $30. And I have collected a very typical buy scale through from definitely buy through to definitely not buy. And I group together the definitely and the probably buy. And what we see is that at $20, 55% of people are going to buy it. If I increase the price to $25, it only drops a bit to 45% of the people saying they would buy it. But if I go to $30, it drops down to just 15% saying they're going to buy it. If we look at the price change, when I go from $20 to $25, that's an increase of 25%. When I go from $25 to $30, that's an increase of 20%. And if I look at the demand change, going from $20 to $25 gave me a drop of just 18%. That's less than the 25% that the price went up. So that is a relatively inelastic change. It's 0.73 minus 73%. On the other hand, when I go from $25 to $30, the price went up 20%. The demand went down 67%, which is a ratio of 3.33 or minus 333%. We'd say that's relatively elastic. So on this sort of test, we would end up recommending, yeah, $25 looks good. Demand is slightly higher at $20. We don't actually know whether $29 would be a really good place because we only have three data points. And it could be that just going to $30 causes the problem. We can get price reversals with this sort of test. So imagine we've done a concept test with 200 participants for each of three prices. Well, with 200 participants, we've got a sampling error at the 95% level of just over 6%, plus or minus 6%. Now, imagine we know what the real demand for the product is, that at $10, 30% of people will buy it, at $12, 28% will buy it, at $14, 26% will buy it. But we do our test with 200 people per cell, and we might find that at $10, 30% will buy it, and at $12, 26% would buy it, which is very close to our 28% that, that is real, well within the sampling error. And at $14, we think that 28% of people will buy it, which is really close to the true value, well within the sampling error. But we have a price reversal. We are suggesting that if you increase the price from $12 to $14, that the sales will go up. And that does not normally happen. There are some special cases where it might, but normally it doesn't happen. If we had a larger sample size, these price reversals are less likely. But price reversals are one of the things we need to keep an eye on. So for each of the tests I'm gonna show you, the methods, I'm gonna do this little overview at the end, which will tell you about what you need to know. So if you are doing price concept tests, you really need benchmarks. So you can say to your client, we have done 500 other tests. We know how predictive these numbers are. You need to divide them by three, or you need to take the square root, or you need to do this to adjust them between the test results and the real marketplace. You get rich diagnostics. You get all those likes and dislikes and the substitutions you can get price reversals in the data. 
normally do not get any feedback on what the competitors might do. All you've done is looked at the new product. The typical sample would be 100 to 200 per cell, per price point. The analysis tends to be at the aggregate level. You're looking at the total sample or the subgroup. The subgroup might be men versus women or north versus south. The market size can be an n sum market. So we can forecast the whole market growing or the whole market shrinking as a result of this change. We can't really do what if modeling or if we can, it's very limited. So the next test I want to talk about is the Gabor Granger test, which was developed by economists back in the 1960s. And I'm going to talk to you about two versions, the monadic version and the sequential version. And what we're trying to find out from the participants is the highest price they're willing to pay for a product or service. Now, of course, this assumes that people can and would correctly tell us the price at which they would switch from being a buyer to a non-buyer. This is a real problem because, as I said before, our ability to know what we would do in the future and our ability to know what we would do if the price changes is quite flawed. So imagine we've interviewed 10 people and we just got them to write down what is the highest price they would be willing to pay. We might end up with this data here and we can see that respondent one says I would pay $2.50. Participant two would pay $3 all the way through to participant 10 who would pay $7.50. With that sort of information, we can draw the demand curve, which is the blue line on this chart. And of course, the demand goes down at $1.50 we would sell a product to all 10 of these people. At $2, we would. At $2.50, we would. But at $3, it drops to 9 And it keeps falling as the price goes up and up and up. And eventually at $8, we see that we're not selling any more product. We can multiply the price by the number of products in order to get the revenue line. And sometimes the client is interested in market share, which is how many products would be demanded. Sometimes they're interested in revenue, which is price times the number of products. And of course, sometimes they're interested in margin or profit or gross profit. It's really important to know which one your client is interested in. So the first way of doing Gabor Grange I'm going to talk about is a free format one. Show the concept or the product to people and simply ask them what's the most they would be willing to pay to buy it. Typical sample, 160 to 400 people. Now, participants do struggle to answer this question, partly because of lack of context and this inability to forecast, but you can make it much better by being projective. So instead of saying, what is the highest price you would pay for this? You can say, what is the highest price that people would pay for this? That you will find out is more predictive than asking people what is the highest price they would pay. We can also do it differently. We can generate random value. So we create a set of prices we're going to show the participants. And we show the concept or the product or the service to each person and randomly draw a price and say, would you be willing to pay that price? And we're going to want to collect about 100 to 200 opinions for each of those price points. For each price point, we generate the percentage willing to pay. Again, we can get reversals where a higher percentage seem to want to pay more than the lower price. And that's simply to do with sampling error. We can also do a sequential version using pattern values. So we create a set of prices just like we did with the random one. And we show the concept or the product for each participant. And then we ask the prices in a pattern. One traditional way is you ask the cheapest. And if they would say, yes, I'd buy it, you ask the next price until they stop. I prefer to start in the middle. If they would buy it, increase it. If they wouldn't buy it, drop the price. And ask that question three or four times and you'll get relatively close to the point that they would buy it. Typically, we're looking at a sample size of 160 to 400. So here's the summary for Gabor Granger. 
The diagnostics tend to be really poor. It tells you simply whether people are buying it or not. You could, of course, ask questions. Price reversals are possible, particularly with the Monadic version. We're not looking at competitors' reactions. We're only looking at the products we're testing. The typical sample size would be 160 to 400 if we're doing a sequential test. If we're doing a monadic test looking at different price points, we're probably talking more like a thousand people. The analysis tends to be at the aggregates or the subgroup level. So we're looking at the total sample or we're looking at young versus old or we're, and we're looking at regular users versus occasional users. It is an N sum market, so it's capable of telling you whether the market gets bigger or smaller as the price changes. Again, we can't do what if modeling based on Gabor Granger, or it's a very restricted form of what if modeling. Next one I'm going to talk about is the Van Westendorp measure, which is also called the price sensitivity measure, sometimes just referred to as PSM. And this was developed back in the 1970s by the Dutch psychologist. And what we're trying to do with this is address some of the weaknesses with the Gabor Granger. And the, the sweet spot for the PSM, for the Van Westendorp method, is where we're talking about at what price could we launch a new product or a new service, something that's quite new to the market. So... The traditional way of asking this question is we would show them the concept and then say, at what price would you say the offering is inexpensive or what price would you say it's cheap or what price would you say it's good value? It differs by market, it differs by language, it differs by exactly the product you're testing. And the others are some version of at what price would you say the offering is expensive but worth considering at what price would you say the offering is too expensive to consider? At what price would you say the offering is so cheap you'd worry about the quality? And we can either use a drop down list for those prices, which means we can control reversals, or we ask people to type in the prices. The problem with the drop down list is that we are giving a framework, and one of the things we're trying to discover is what is the framework from the participants. We can get this sort of data and here imagine that I've collected data from 100 people and we'll look at the top row of that data. $13, 56, 56 of the people in this study said it was too cheap. They would doubt the quality. 41% thought it was cheap, it was good value. 3% thought it was expensive but they would consider it. Nobody thought it was too expensive to consider. And we add two columns to the data, the not cheap, which is the expensive plus the too expensive. And there is the not expensive, which is the too cheap plus the cheap. And as we go down the table, the price is going up. The number of people who think it's cheap goes down and the number of people who think it's expensive goes up. And we can then plot that data in a variety of ways. So one of the ways is called the indifference point. It's often the price of the market leader or the medium price in a marketplace. It's where the cheap curve crosses the expensive curve. Now, there is nothing magical about any of these data points. Sometimes you'll see researchers saying this is the key message. No, it's actually a much more approximate tool than that. The next one is the optimum point. And again, some consultants will tell you this is the recommended price. It's where the too cheap curve crosses the too expensive curve. But I prefer to think of it this way, which is the range of acceptable prices. So on the lowest, on the left hand side, we have the lowest reasonable price, which is where the too cheap crosses the not cheap curve. And on the right hand side, we have the highest reasonable price, which is where the too expensive curve crosses the not expensive curve. So if I had done this study for my client, I would go back to them and say, the data suggests that it's going to be in the region of 18 to $22. That is what the market is expecting. Is that what you're looking to charge? The strengths, it's great at giving you this general idea of what the market will pay for something. 
But the weakness is you can't use it to fine tune prices. It doesn't include the competitive mix. You can't say you've got 10 products. It doesn't help you adjust the price of all 10 products, the portfolio. So here is the overview. It gives you some diagnostics, which is nice. Um, you can avoid price reversals with care. It doesn't look at the competitors. What are competitors doing in the marketplace? The typical sample size would be 200 to 400. Um, the analysis level, again, tends to be aggregate or the subgroup level. It does let you look at the market growing or shrinking. So it's an ensemble market technique. And we don't really get any what if modeling or it's quite restricted. The next technique I'm going to talk about is the brand price trade off. So brand price trade off takes a range of products. And in this example, I'm going to show you some coffees. And for each one of these coffees, we have got their typical market price and then prices below that and prices above that. And the prices that are going to actually step down 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. But what I'm going to show are real prices in dollars. And we set up a synthetic shop and we show the coffees to the customer and say, if these coffees were available and this was the price, which one would you pick? And this person is saying, I'm going to pick the Dow Egberts. What happens then is that the price of the Dow Egberts goes up from 529 to 582 and the price of all the other products goes down, making it a much more tricky conversation. The person now has to think and we say, what would you pick next? And they say, I'll pick the Nescafe Alter Eco. So the price of the Old Tarika will go up, the price of the Dow Egberts and all the others will go down. So we keep trying to find a point where it's really hard for the person to choose which of these products they're going to buy. And we would typically ask 10 of those questions. What have we collected for each participant in the research? We have a price value for each product. So for any given set of prices, we should be able to estimate which one would they choose. For each product, we have the value that each participant has for it, the number of people who chose it first, who value it most, and also the number of people who never picked it, even if we reduce the price 10 times. We can then start modeling price, and this is the what if modeling. So we have the products there. We say, well, if we made this change to the price, there is the base share, there's the model share, there's what we see the change as being. So all of a sudden we can do this. What if modeling, we can look at the whole marketplace. We can from that generate price demand curves. So here's the one for Alta Rica. As the price goes up, it falls. Now notice that curve is not a straight line. Normally demand curves are not straight lines. So taking our overview of brand price trade-off, it gives you some diagnostics because of the what if modeling. You won't get price reversals from this because of the way the data is collected. Yes, you can look at competitor actions. You can say, what happens if I increase my price, but my competitor decreases their price? Typically, we're looking at 200 to 400 interviews. The analysis is now at the participant level. We can pull the data into any shape we want. We can look at how individuals change their behavior. We have a zero sum market. The model assumes that everybody is going to buy a jar of coffee. So we put the price up and we can see changes in which products are purchased, but the total amount of products being purchased stays the same. And yes, we have what if modeling. So the final one we're going to look at is conjoint analysis. And this was first developed in the 1970s. Lots of types of conjoint analysis is full profile ratings, adaptive and choice based. These days, discrete choice modeling is the most common and it's a direct descendant of all those other techniques. And it looks at more than just price. It looks at brand. It looks at features. It looks at alternatives. So let's think about an example. We're doing a study looking at hotels. We've got brands along the top. We've got whether or not it has room service. We have 
whether or not it's got internet and do you have to pay for the internet it's got its location and then we have the price and the participants see a range of these screens typically 10 of these screens and say which one would they choose and from that we can work out the importance of brand the importance of room service and the way that price works within that when we do that we end up with a choice model and we end up with a what if modeling tool that allows us to look at prices um, look at changes in the the offering for each of those hotels what do we get when we do conjoint we get a lot of diagnostics we really understand how the market's working if we are careful we don't get price reversals can we look at competitor options yes typical sample size 200 to 400 the analysis is going on at the participant level we can group it any way we like again it tends to be a zero-sum market we are assuming that people will pick an option what if modeling yes it's worth saying of course it's much more expensive to do a conjoint study why don't we do a conjoint study instead of the Borg Ranger there is a massive difference in terms of the design cost, the implementation cost, and the analysis cost. So which technique are we going to use? We've got to think about the objectives and the budget. The first rule is choose the simplest, cheapest technique which will answer the problem. There is no single solution. So we are simply going to find a technique that will solve the problem and which is going to do it efficiently, inexpensively and appropriately. One of the determinants in that process is whether price is the main reason for doing the study or is it an additional part. If the whole study is about finding the dynamics of pricing in a marketplace, we are probably going to be talking a brand price trade-off study or a conjoint study. But we won't be able to do much else because those are quite lengthy parts of the survey. If, on the other hand, we are trying to find out all about a product and how this product works and what people think about it and what we can charge, then we are more likely to be thinking about a price concept test or a PSM, price sensitivity measure. If, on the other hand, we have something like a visitor tracking study, and we'd like to know what people would pay for a whole range of alternatives, we might add a Gabor Granger question, a single question to an existing visitor tracking study, and we get 10,000 interviews during the year, and we build up a lot of information about what people would pay for new possible attractions and alternatives. We also need to think about what are we testing? Are we testing a known product? For example, are we testing minor price changes to a range of things like latte, cappuccino, espresso, and so on? In which case, something like the conjoint study, something like the brand price trade-off can be really strong. Or are we testing some out-of-the-box concept? Imagine we were testing the first iPhone. We were testing the first Netflix. At that point, it's really hard for people to imagine what they would pay for it and how they would use it because it doesn't exist in their world. So we can't then ask them 10 questions about if we change the price, would you like it more, would you like it less? So we are going to be looking at something more like the price concept test or the Van Westendorf to get some sort of approximate idea of where people think the pricing is going to be. So there is an introduction to pricing research and I look forward to any questions shortly. Great. Thanks so much, Ray. That was a great overview of some of the different pricing techniques and things that um, you need to consider when thinking about pricing research. And I think there's a lot of good questions coming in. So if you haven't asked your question yet, feel free to put that in the Q&A. Um, the next thing that I'm going to be doing is giving you a brief overview of Question Pro and some of the different techniques and how Question Pro thinks about some of these different pricing techniques, what it looks like in our system and so forth, and just kind of recap some of those different 
techniques here. So give me a minute to cue this up and then we will go over that. And then once I'm done, we'll go into the Q&A with Ray Pointer here. So let's cover this. Okay, so pricing analytics with Question Pro. So just an overview of Question Pro, if you, if you all aren't familiar, the Question Pro research platform really has four main components, the surveys component where the majority of the pricing research is done. Although you could say audience also covers that if you need those respondents to take your survey. We have an audience uh, platform and panels as well. We have a communities platform. Many of our clients are making use of this and then services and partnerships that if you need help with your research, whether that's programming or analysis uh, or any, any stage in the research process, we can help you out with that as well. Now, I know today we're talking about pricing, purchase behavior, pricing sensitivity, and that's certainly the, the customer intelligence that we can help you with. There's a number of different um, solutions that we can help cover and from products and service research to ad testing, AB testing, market dynamics and trends. So it's one platform for many solutions as uh, many of you on the call know, because I know we have a lot of customers and, and, and the like here as well. Now time to get into pricing modeling and um, some of the different applications that Question Pro has in terms of, you know, Ray mentioned Garber Granger price modeling. And this is certainly something that, that we have in our platform, just to recap, it's really to find the maximum price a respondent is willing to pay. So what this looks like in the Question Pro platform is this, similar to the, the chart or the graph that Ray showed where you can see that there's the percent demand and then the revenue curve and where those intersect. You, you can get all of that along with um, easily calculating the revenue maximizing price points um, and the very different price paths. I think <clears throat> with Garber Granger, uh, the, really you want to use it for um, for determining those revenue maximizing price points. So use this when you know some of the different starting points that you want, and then this will help you get those maximizing price points with uh, the demand as well. So this is um, used in our platform. We have some of those different types that Ray mentioned from random and sequential as well. In terms of Van Westendorp, I know this is a popular one and there's a lot of questions about this. So we'll definitely get to those with Ray uh, in a minute here. But I, ideally, you know, Van Westendorp, as Ray mentioned, is to understand how much respondents are willing to pay for a product or service at those different price points. So what's too expensive, what's expensive, but you would still pay for it too cheap and then a good value. So really playing off of consumer perceptions, acceptable pricing and revenue and market share analysis. I think if you're unsure of what price points the market can potentially accept, then Van Westendorp is a good model to use there. And this is available in the, the question for research suite as well. So that's something that you can definitely make use of. I wanted to, to talk about max diff analysis just briefly here and bring this up because while it's not necessarily pricing, it is product and the you can use the max diff analysis here to help with pricing research by finding really what attributes and features are important that then obviously could potentially affect the price so that you could use this at, at some stage in, in research you're doing around a new product and the price and, and what the market's willing to bear. I think what some of the interesting things about our platform is that, yeah, you can do the max diff, the traditional max diff with most and least preferred, but you can also use anchored max diff, which really to put it simply is that in traditional max diff and maybe that feature A is twice as important as feature B but what we find out obviously from doing the max diff exercise, but it could also be that neither A nor B is very important at all. And we would not find this out from traditional max diff by adding the anchoring question, it allows researchers to add an additional question in essentially that would determine whether all of the, if any of the features are fundamentally important or not. So relative to those features, what, what is, is it important or not? And that's really where anchored max diff would come in. So you would be able to know, yeah, these, these features are important and feature A is twice as important as feature B. So the anchoring definitely helps you get at that. And I think it's a, you know, a key component inside of max diff and in any sort of 
um, product or, or pricing research that you want to do. It's always good to have that max diff question at your disposal. And then finally, conjoint analysis, as Ray mentioned, there are many different types. The most popular and the one that we have in our platform is the discrete choice um, modeling. So this obviously looks similar to what Ray showed, but essentially this is great in determining the products or features and then at what price point um, a consumer is willing to, to spend. So you can definitely analyze the trade-offs as Ray mentioned, and then um, attribute importance and different market simulations that you can do inside of this model here. Now you can see in this particular chart, it has the, the price brand as an example. And you can see the different utility scores that you would get along with best and worst profile. And then you can play around with how that affects market share and so forth. So this is um, great to include. Although as I think as Ray mentioned and we've talked about before, if you're gonna be doing a conjoint analysis study, it's typically gonna be the one of the only main questions inside of your survey, where if you do Van Westendorp and others, you can include some other question types, but just because of the really the, the cognitive load on the respondent. So with that, I wanted to jump to the Q&A and I will turn about my video back on here. And I believe Ray will also turn his on as well. Hey, Ray, how are you? Good, thanks. Good, thanks so much for sharing those. We have, we have a lot of interesting questions that I wanted to get to. So let me just cue these up here. I got them um, coming in. Um, and Ray, there were a lot of questions around um, Van Westendorp. I, I guess to kick it off, there was uh, someone had mentioned that there seemed to be a fifth question in, in the Van Westendorp, their price and sensitivity model. Is that, was that by design or what? Traditionally, it's four questions, but I think there was a fifth one in one of your examples. Is yeah, that right? Um, so sometimes I'll add a fifth one, which is, would you buy it at this mm -hmm. price? Okay. Um, and that can sometimes give me better data, but also, um, as I know we've discussed that, I will often change the wording of those Van Westendorf questions. So yep. I'll ask people to say, thinking about buyers of grocery shopping, thinkers, thinking about hires of fleet cars, whatever it is, whether it's B2C or B2B, what do you think people will think is too expensive? What do you think people will say is too cheap to trust it? Because actually we're better at predicting other people. So I will often run mm -hmm. through those and then say, right, at that cheap price, would you actually buy it? And if they say yes, and would you actually buy it at the expensive price? Um, and that can give you some, some better definition about not just what people are expecting, but whether they think they were going to buy. Got it. Yeah, that, okay, that makes sense. So that was that additional question. Perfect. Uh, there were some questions around that. I think, you know, kind of similarly, um, we had a, there was another question around the Van Westendorf PSM while we're talking about it. Um, so there was a, we had, without giving away too much here, there were, one of the questions was around sort of this 24 hour versus 48 hour service. And when they ran their, the PSM or Van Westendorp, they didn't see much difference um, between the 24 versus the 48 hour in terms of, um, the the sensitivity around the pricing. Do you think that um, maybe like Garber Granger would have been a better question type to ask there between the 24 and 48 hour? Um, that was one of the questions or have, have you encountered where you would use maybe um, kind of a case what? by case or side by side study where you use Van Westendorp asking the same kind of questions around a product and then using Garber Granger around the same product and seeing how those compared or what would be your recommendations? There? Yeah, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna dive into the core of that because actually this is something that occurs and it's, fan, it's a fantastic question when it does. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've offered service A, service B, here you say 24 hours, 48 hours, mm -hmm. and we've got a similar response. So one of two things is happening. One of three things is happening. The test is not sensitive enough, mm -hmm. one, or, people don't see a value difference between one and the other, or you have not explained the value difference. So it could be a communication error. It could be that people um, don't think there is a big enough difference between 28 at four, 24 hours and 48. So we're gonna start digging into that. And we're gonna 
dig into it with some qualitative questions around that and say, okay, you, you've come up with this sort of information. What if we did this? We can also use the Kapoor Grange. So now what price would you pay for a 24 hour service? And asking some of the same people, would you, what would you pay for 48? Mm. And I'm gonna switch that round for some of the cells and do the 48 first and the 24. And right. for everybody who tells me it's the same price, I'm gonna ask why? Well, for a percentage of them, I can trigger that question to come through and find out a little bit about why. And it might be that they think, well, actually I'm gonna drop it off and pick it up and it doesn't really matter to me. Um, or 24 is too slow. Right. So 48 is actually very similar. So there's all sorts of possible there, but three, is the test not sensitive enough? Do people not value the difference? Or have you not communicated the difference? And you have to then dig into that. Right. Well, that makes sense. I like asking a certain subset of, you know, kind of the follow-up question because not to make it too, you know, taxing on the on the respondent. One one question came up around sort of sample sizes and you know coming close to the 150. It looks like you had some different sample sizes and the different some of those yeah. different tests. Is there around like how do you derive at those and is it is that like the minimum number the maximum is anything above that you're just kind of not wasting money but it's not really necessary how what what sort of your thoughts are okay what are your so thoughts around those? There, was, there was a nice comment in the chat about somebody about the difference between b2c and b2b yep exactly yep. in okay. most cases there isn't a great difference between them because actually it's humans at the other end but there are some really important ones one of those is sample size if you're doing B2C, get as big a sample size as you can. Sample is relatively cheap these days. Mm -hmm. If you're in B2B, it's somewhere between expensive or extortionate. So you're gonna have to be working with a smaller sample size and that will sometimes drive which pricing study you're gonna be doing. Because there are a couple of things that are driving what we would recommend as a sample size. If everybody is only if when we do a, an interview with somebody, they give us one data point, then we're going to need a bigger sample size. So in the very simple Gabor Granger, where we've added just one question to an existing study, they're only seeing one price, they're giving us some feedback on the one price, the sample size is going to be much bigger because I've got 100 to 150 per price point that I'm going to want to ask. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, we are getting a range of information from people, a bit more like the Van Western Dorp, or we've made the Gabor Granger progressive. So we're getting a range of yes, no information from them. Then we can use a smaller sample size because they're covering more data points. But they're still yes or no's. We're talking about percentages. So we're using NPQ in terms of our sample size thinking. But if we get degrees of thinking from somebody, like we get with conjoint, we're getting a share of preference. Now we are talking about means and standard deviations. Mm -hmm. And depending on what that standard deviation comes out to be, the sample size becomes smaller again. So individual points, bigger sample size. Multiple points per person, but they are unique positions, middle size sample. If we're getting a range of values from people and they're no longer um, integers, then the sample size implication is, is lower again. Got it, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. That That's good, I think that, that answers the question. We, we had a few questions around the, the uh, BPTO model that you mentioned, Ray. And one is around what's, what determines how the prices are changed. So if they select, I think that one coffee example, then the prices went up. What, what sort of determines that? Yeah, so the, in terms of which way the prices go, yeah. it's pretty intuitive. The one they pick goes up in price. All of the others go down in price. Mm. Um, there, there are a couple of papers published by me, and there's a couple by a guy called Tim Bock looking at this as well. Mm. So actually, you can program it to be slightly smarter than that. So let's say we've got Coke, we've got Pepsi. I buy the Coke, so its price goes up. I buy the Coke again, so its price goes up. Next time I buy the Pepsi, 
So the price of the coat comes down, but not as far as it used to be. So it covers half the gap hmm. to the price it was last time. And then if I buy it, it goes up half the way to the previous high. And if I still don't buy it, it covers down half again from the price that you didn't buy it through to the price that you did buy it. So the pricing mechanism has got a step, which is if it's never been picked or it's never, yes, if it's never been picked, this is the amount it's changing. But from there on in, it's all about halving. So half the gap from when it was bought to when it wasn't, okay. and it homes in. And then you, you tend to do six, seven, maybe 10 of these questions, because the more questions you ask in pricing, the less real it gets for the participants. Got it. That makes sense. Yeah, that I think that really helps out there. And then I think maybe it's the same model, or this can probably be extrapolated across the different models that we covered today is around, you know, obviously like the stimulus or what you present to the respondents can have an effect on the responses and the outcome. What's, what's your recommendation to how much definition and how specific um, is enough and what would be too much or how do you gauge that, right? I mean, you want to make it as real as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about a McDonald's menu, it's up there on the wall in front of you. It's product and prices. And you'd want to look very similar to that. If we're doing um, detergent cleaners, each wants to look like the see, what you'll see in a supermarket when you're out shopping. Um, if you are talking about buying surgical devices for a hospital, it wants to look like the purchase summary form. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're gonna to have to ask people to read documents. So if we're into things like mortgages and loans, you may well spend five or 10 minutes getting them up to speed, just like you would in a real sales situation, you'd spend an hour talking to them. So we wanna make it as much like the real purchase situation. If they would look at it in depth, they should look at it in depth in the, in the research. Hmm. But if they would, um, they're coming off an aeroplane, they're walking past um, a range of products on sale and they're going to decide whether to, to buy them or not. We want to be that sort of speed in the, the research too. So a basic picture, price, um, but not lots and lots of product detail unless people would look at product detail. Hmm. And that makes sense. You want to sort of try to mirror that the decision and, and give as much. It would be as much like the real world. Right? So. Sorry, did I cut you off there, Ray? No, no, sorry. I think we were slightly talking over each other. Just as much like the real world as you can. Got yeah. it. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Makes sense. There's so many good questions coming in. I think we have time for a few more here. Um, so the next one is, so the, this person is interested in understanding what is the typical most used approach in maybe complex technological um, industries where you don't have, you know, there's not hundreds or thousands of buyers, but more in a B2B context? Um, what, what sort of pricing technique would you recommend in that framework, right? Slightly different questions. What is the most common? What would I recommend? The most common is probably A-B testing. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't see that very much. So the one that we see is the conjoint study, um, where you're showing them options, configurations. So I'm, I'm looking at chip designers from different organizations around the world. I'm putting up different things to do with the reprogrammable speed, the voltage, the wires, and asking them net which one of these are they going to pick? Because I'm usually interested in more than just price. I want to know how much are they going to trade off heat sinking versus capacity versus quantity that can be supplied versus price and these sort of issues. Mm -hmm. um, because quite often when we're talking, say designers of products, price is not at the top of their mind. It's important but so are a lot of other characteristics. So mm. that's one of the reasons why conjoint is so big in that 
technical sort of zone. And it also comes back to the depth of information because you're probably talking to fewer people. You want a, your information not just to be yeses and nos, but to have some graduation within it. Where So we're moving into that world of means and standard deviations rather than our NPQ. Got it. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I really like what you said around um, that price may not even be like they might pay anything as long as not anything, but you know, in, in those regards, as long as you can meet their needs, right? So I think it kind of depends there. And I think that, that, that makes sense. Makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, if we talk about a hotel, I want my hotel to be clean, safe, good Wi Fi at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's got to have good Wi Fi. That's the non negotiable one. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, cool. So then uh, maybe, maybe two more questions here, Ray, and then we can follow up on any of these. Um, after the webinar today, but this is sort of like, what would you recommend or sort of a, a question, but in a product, what would you recommend in a case where the product is not new news, but um, is a premium product that has a very inexpensive substitute um, example, like a fancy coffee machine when Mr. Coffee machine is on the market. So a high price or low price. Uh, what, what sort of would you recommend for a more premium product? Um, if I'm introducing the product, then I'm going to be looking at Van Westendorf to see whether or not that premium is being communicated. And I'm probably testing the communication as much as I'm testing the price when I'm doing that. Um, if the product is, is much more familiar, then I'm going to be quite happy going into a conjoint um, if we've got enough features around that to, to find out what it is. But the sample is going to be really important. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty much going to screen out everybody who is not willing to consider buying in this area, but I'm going to add those people back in when I come to my model to say, okay, we're looking at 100% of the US, 90% we've ruled out. So here's what the 10% think. Now let's then grade that 10% again, because actually they're, they're only 10% of the whole market. Right, right. No, that makes sense. And I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, maybe on Live with Dan, or, or this, maybe it was another conversation, but around, this is where you really have to frame up around, hey, would you pay $4 for a coffee? But if you said, hey, if you're walking into a Starbucks, would you pay $4 for that coffee? Whereas if you maybe you wouldn't, if you're just going to the corner store, convenience store, right? So sort of where they're yeah. buying it and framing that up might, might be a key consideration as well. Yeah, so if you were gonna buy a premium coffee maker, can be part of that framing conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting, okay. Um, let me see here. There was one more question that I wanted to get to. I'm just failing to find it now, of course. Uh, all right. Um, I think, Ray, was there anything else that you wanted to cover on the webinar today? Probably just the, that comment that, that I put right at the beginning is for some things, there isn't a good solution at the moment. Mm -hmm. So how much would you pay for toilet paper if there were another pandemic lockdown? Mm. You know, it's really hard for people to know what products are going to be in shortage next time round and what they would be willing to pay for them. Um, what are people willing to pay for cryptocurrency? It changes so much. Um, the, the Bitcoin price, these non-fungible tokens. Mm -hmm. So there, there are things out there where we don't have a good pricing solution for at the moment. Right. Yeah, the... The NFTs is interesting to me. And how would you price those? Like that's a kind of an evolving marketplace in itself. Yeah. Um, one, okay. One, I found the question that I wanted to ask you, Ray. So I think there was a few questions around this, around conjoint and making sure that your respondents understand the question, right? So maybe it's, it's technical or there are some considerations that they need to make sure they take in, into account. How do you how do you get around that or how do you make sure that 
the respondents under really understand what you're asking about before they sort of get into the into the exercise or or even the method that you want to ask them yeah i mean this all comes back to good design and piloting so you sure. take the survey to the sort of people who are going to do it and say now what do you what here are four options you tell me in your own word what those four options are and which one you would choose and then tell me why you would choose it right. um and you will see whether or not that is because people are understanding it or have we talked about it in either the client's language or in our language instead of the customer's language. Now that's right. less of a problem with B2B because that language tends to be shared. But when we're talking, if, if we're talking about pharma, there can be a real problem sometimes of describing the product in words that the pharma industry uses but people don't. Right, that's true. You have to avoid a lot of the, the technical jargon as they say, right? Yeah. Great, well, hey, Ray, thank you so much for joining me on this webinar today. I know it was informative. There's lots of questions. We'll try to get back to you on these questions as well. If you wanna find more, find us, we're available on all these different platforms. I know Ray is pretty active on Twitter and LinkedIn, but feel free to reach out to us. And with that, we'll wrap up the webinar for today. Ray, thank you so much for joining me today on this webinar. Pleasure. Pleasure, Dan. Always good talking to you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time today. Bye.